Welcome to Clinical Minute. Sam is a 23-year-old Gravita Zero Para Zero. Based on the information from his intake form, you note that the sex assigned to Sam at birth was female. However, his gender is male, and he uses he, him, his pronouns. He identifies as gay and currently has a cisgender male partner whom he has been dating for a year and a half. Sam began testosterone one year ago and receives a half cc every 12 days. Sam has never had a pap test and he tested negative for STIs one year ago. When you ask Sam how you can help him today, he says that he'd like to talk about his birth control options. When counseling Sam on his contraceptive options, you follow recommendations for gender-inclusive contraceptive counseling, starting with your language. You know that sex and gender are not interchangeable. A person's sex is the label that they were assigned at birth, usually based on assessment of genitalia. In contrast, a person's gender is a social construction based on cultural norms. A gender identity is an individual's internal awareness or sense of where one fits on the spectrum. In the case of Sam, his sex is female and his gender identity is male. Sam's gender expression, defined as the way that a person communicates their gender through appearance and behavior, also appears to be traditionally masculine. You know that sexual orientation, identity, and behavior cannot be predicted by sex or gender, so you review Sam's answers on his intake form regarding his sexual orientation and behavior. Sam identifies as gay, meaning that he is emotionally, romantically, or sexually attracted to men. You find that Sam's sexual behavior aligns with his sexual identity in that he currently engages in sexual activity with his male partner. Although the most recent CDC guidelines promote comprehensive contraceptive provision to all people, including cisgender male and lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender, or LGBT patients, there is minimal content for addressing the specific needs of unique populations. What are some considerations for contraceptive counseling for transgender men like Sam? You know from your research that testosterone is not an effective form of contraception for transgender men. However, all other options that are used for cisgender female clients can be used for transgender men. You know that it will be important to consider Sam's preferences carefully, given that he may have different priorities compared with cisgender female clients. Since Sam is presenting for a contraceptive consult, you plan to follow the CDC's five steps of quality contraceptive counseling. The first step is to establish and maintain a rapport with the client. You know that this involves demonstrating expertise, trustworthiness, accessibility, empathy, and acceptance. Given that Sam is a member of a historically marginalized group in healthcare and in society at large, you take the time to ensure that you are using Sam's preferred pronouns to help make him comfortable and demonstrate respect. The second step is to obtain clinical and social information from Sam. While you have begun this process with the intake form, you will continue to elicit information from Sam throughout his visit. Step 3 involves working with the client interactively to select the most effective and appropriate contraceptive method. Step 4 is conducting a physical assessment related to contraceptive use, such as obtaining blood pressure readings for patients who are considering combined hormonal contraceptive pills. The fifth and final step is to provide the patient with the contraceptive method along with instructions about correct and consistent use. To ensure proper use of the contraception, Clinicians should work with clients to develop a plan for using the selected method as well as a plan for follow-up. For Sam's visit, you continue to step two, which is eliciting clinical and social information. What is your next question for Sam? You know that the CDC recommends that you elicit Sam's reproductive life plan by asking, do you plan to have any children at any time in your future? Sam replies that neither he nor his partner want children right now. He does mention that he may want children in the future, and he is unsure about whether he will want to carry the pregnancy or consider adoption. Sam also shares that he is particularly concerned, for the moment, about using birth control that works very well to prevent pregnancy. He is worried about how testosterone might affect a pregnancy. 
He is also worried about how being pregnant would make him feel about his body. How do you continue to elicit information from Sam using open-ended questions? You continue to ask about Sam's reproductive plans by asking, how are you currently preventing pregnancy? You know that this is an important question since Sam's current habits could influence his contraceptive preferences and values for the future. Sam explains that his partner uses condoms regularly during occasional penetrative penis and vagina sex. They have never engaged in unprotected intercourse. However, Sam is looking for a contraceptive option that could potentially allow for more spontaneity. Sam then tells you, unprompted, that he would prefer contraception that does not involve hormones since he has seen good results with his testosterone injections. You next ask Sam to tell you a little bit about his current and past menstruation. Sam explains that before he began testosterone, he had irregular menses every two to three months. He began getting his period at age 12, and he has not had vaginal bleeding since beginning testosterone. He says that he has really liked not having a period, but for him, this was a bonus of testosterone and not the main benefit. You have noted that one of Sam's main preferences is a contraception without hormones and that he is looking for a highly effective method. Since he said that he may consider pregnancy in the future, you decide not to bring up permanent contraception as an option at this time. Given Sam's reproductive plan and preferences, you know that there are several options for contraception that could be discussed. You say to Sam, there are a few options for non-hormonal birth control, including a long-acting reversible contraceptive, or LARC, and a variety of barrier methods. Since effectiveness is important for Sam, you begin with the most effective non-hormonal reversible option, the copper IUD. You tell Sam, I'm going to tell you about the copper IUD. The copper IUD is a hormone-free device that's placed in the uterus, it is one of the most effective forms of birth control, preventing over 99% of pregnancies. You explain to Sam that the copper IUD is FDA approved for up to 10 years of effectiveness and has been shown to work for up to 12 years. You then discuss the potential adverse events of the copper IUD with Sam. You explain that cramping, back pain, and heavy bleeding are some of the most common side effects of the copper IUD. You say, there is also a chance that you will have vaginal bleeding after the insertion of the IUD. While there are no studies to support how common this is in transgender men, we do know that many cisgender women experience heavier and longer menstrual cycles for anywhere from one to three months, up to a year after the insertion of the copper IUD. For most, these heavier and longer periods decrease after one year. Since you have already stopped getting periods on testosterone, we recommend that you come in for an evaluation if you experience bleeding beyond the first week after the IUD is inserted. Bleeding for you might indicate that the IUD is displaced in your cervix, that it has been expelled and you are pregnant, or that there are other conditions unrelated to the IUD that we should address. These other conditions might include an STI, uterine fibroids, or in rare cases, uterine or cervical cancer. Finally, you tell Sam that the insertion procedure, while quick, can cause cramping, and sometimes people experience fainting. The last thing that you mention to Sam is that the copper IUD is both convenient and discreet, although you do not spend too much time discussing this, as these were not indicated as high priorities for Sam. While they are additional considerations, they are likely not deciding factors. After discussing the copper IUD, you continue to review other non-hormonal barrier methods, you say to Sam, I know you are already using condoms, which is one barrier method. There are also other barrier options, including the diaphragm, the sponge, the cervical cap, or spermicide. Are you interested in hearing about any of these types of barrier methods? Sam responds that he does not have any interest in using these other barrier methods at this time, since he has already been using condoms and wants to try something that does not require use every time he and his partner have sex. Once you have explained the various options to Sam, you pause and ask whether he has any questions. Sam replies that he is leaning toward the IUD, but he has some concerns about bleeding after the IUD insertion. He says that he is also worried about the insertion procedure, as he is uncomfortable with the idea of a genital examination. What are some things you can do to make the process easier for Sam? 
You begin by listening and affirming Sam's concerns. You say, I understand why bleeding and the insertion procedure would be concerning to you. You then say, let's start by discussing the possibility of bleeding. You say to Sam, while there is a good chance that you could experience vaginal bleeding after insertion, there are some things that we may be able to do to make it more manageable. First, we might be able to lighten the bleeding with a short one-week course of ibuprofen. If you experience bleeding, this would be my first suggestion. My second suggestion is actually a question. Is dysphoria, or feeling uncomfortable in your body, an issue that you think you would benefit from a referral to a therapist? Sam responds, no, explaining that he likes not having a menstrual cycle on the testosterone, but that his menses did not previously cause dysmorphia. You remind Sam that bleeding outside of the first three to seven days post-insertion is a good reason to schedule a follow-up, and you also emphasize that the IUD is removable at any time. Regarding Sam's concerns about the insertion procedure and the potential negative effect it might have on him, you begin by telling Sam about the insertion procedure in detail using his preferred language, which you have noticed is genitals. You say to Sam, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about the insertion procedure, and then we can talk about some options for making it easier on you. We can always stop the insertion procedure at any time, so please keep that in mind. Once you have discussed the procedure with Sam, you also offer to prescribe a single dose of diazepam prior to the insertion procedure to help reduce anxiety. If Sam elects to use this medication, you explain that he will need to plan to take it about 30 to 60 minutes prior to the procedure, and that he will need someone to accompany him to the visit as a driver. Sam seems comforted by the information that you've given him, and he asks what the next steps will be. Since Sam is interested in the copper IUD, you use the CDC guidelines on how to reasonably ensure a person is not pregnant to determine whether the IUD can be inserted the same day or whether he should wait. You know that Sam would need to meet one or more of the following criteria. Seven days or less since the start of normal menses. No sexual intercourse since the start of the last menses. Use of a reliable method of contraception correctly and consistently seven days or less after spontaneous or induced abortion, within four weeks postpartum or fully or nearly fully breastfeeding, amenorrheic, and less than six months postpartum. Since Sam uses condoms during every sexual encounter, he meets the criterion of using a reliable method of contraception correctly and consistently, so you offer to perform the insertion procedure that day. Sam says that he would like to schedule an appointment to come back later for the procedure so that he has time to mentally prepare. You schedule his insertion for the following week and say to Sam, it will be important that you continue to use condoms until you come back for the IUD insertion to prevent pregnancy. Even after the IUD has been placed, keep in mind that IUDs will not protect from STIs such as HIV or chlamydia. I therefore encourage the use of dual protection, either with an external condom for your partner or perhaps an internal condom for you. You also encourage Sam to take advantage of the available screening services. You say, I notice that you've never had a pap test before. To minimize the amount of examinations you'll need, I can provide a pap test during the IUD insertion. Is this something that you'd be interested in? Sam agrees to the pap test, which he says he has been avoiding due to his hesitance around a genital examination. You also counsel Sam on the importance of regular STI screening and encourage him to consider HPV vaccination. Sam agrees to receive the HPV vaccination and makes an appointment to come back next week for his IUD insertion. You encourage Sam to call if he has any concerns prior to the procedure. The following week, you insert Sam's copper IUD conduct a pap test, and give him his first dose of his HPV vaccine without incident.